Nice. Okay. So, uh, welcome to the SUNY Law 2020 pre-conference workshop, Are They Learning? Information Literacy Assessment in the Library Classroom. My name is Claire Ehrlich. I'll be the moderator for this session. So I'll be in the background lurking and monitoring questions in the chat. Um, I can also help connect you with tech support. So if you're having any tech issues, please feel free to message me privately. Um, without further ado, let me introduce our two presenters. Nancy Sarah Murillo is an assistant librarian at SUNY Orange Community College. And Logan Rath is an associate librarian at SUNY Brockport and a PhD student at the University at Buffalo. Take it away. Okay, thank you. Okay, so. So welcome to our session. Right, welcome to our session and on behalf of the SUNY Law Information Literacy Committee, now known as SILK. Um, welcome to Are They Learning uh, Information Literacy Assessment in the Classroom. If the library is the heart of the college and university campus, then assessment is a type of stethoscope, kind of looking at how does that heart sound? What can we do to make it stronger? So today we'll be looking at assessment, assessing student learning outcomes in the library in the library classroom. And we hope that this interactive workshop inspires new ideas and refreshes older ones, helping you enter the fall 2020 semester, however that looks, with tools to measure student learning in your library instruction sessions. So this is the agenda for our workshop. I firmly believe in letting you know what to expect right up front um, so that if you realize I'm not in the right place, you can wander over to another session. Uh, we've done the introductions. Uh, we're gonna talk a little bit about assessment, about creating student learning outcomes, selecting a type of assessment, um, and then there's going to be practice time with breakout rooms. Uh, we're going to attempt automatically assigned breakout rooms as part of this session. Um, and we're going to just hope it works. Um, and it, it should, we only have, we have fewer than hundred people. We have 70 people together right now. So it should be pretty straightforward to assign everyone randomly. Um, then you're going to come back and then we're going to send you to another breakout room. And we'll learn today if a random assignment to breakout rooms randomly assigns you to the same group. Uh, it may, it may not. It doesn't matter um, for the second part. Um, and then we're going to bring everyone back for a quick debrief. Right. Um, so the first part or the first like 20 minutes or so of the session, um, because there were all different kinds of levels of <clears throat> knowledge and understanding, we are going to go over a little bit about what is assessment and what are student learning outcomes. Um, so if you know what student learning outcomes are, you know that they ask the question, what do we want our students to know and or be able to do um, after instruction? So assessment asks and tries to answer the question, how do we demonstrate that they can do it or that they know? So let me just restate that. Assessment asks, how do we know that they know? Right? We're striving to uncover that from assessment. How do we know that they know? And if they don't know, or if they can't do, then we ask ourselves, well, what can I do to change or improve that, improve that so that they get it? That's kind of the point of assessment. So next slide. Now this workshop will be focusing on one type of assessment today, but I'm gonna briefly explain some different types of assessment. Pre-assessment, a pre-assessment is a measure of what students already know and or can do. This can be done before class or, or via a poll as students enter the class, for example. Yes, that survey that we sent to you before the session was an example of pre-assessment. Um, formative assessment in the one-shot classroom specifically can be done in bite-sized portions during the class 
um, you, to sort of see, to see if students are getting it, right? Ask students to perform a specific task, for example, then check to see how that goes. Um, summative assessment is the sum or the summary or the gathering of feedback after a class or after a session. It can be done in the traditional form of a test or a quiz, or you may have used rubrics before, analyzing students' annotated bibliographies, for example. Okay, so now we're going to... We have a poll for you. We have a poll for you. If, if we were to ask you a question right now, which we are, what type of assessment would that be? We have about 40 people that have answered so far. Out of 70? Okay. Out of 68 total people right now. And we're at 86% answered, 88%, 91. It's sort of fun to watch it. The percentages go up. 94. There's just four people left. We'll give you about five more seconds. Okay. 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 So I'm going to share the results. Okay. And you should see the results on your screen right now. Right. So, so if I were teaching this class, which I am co-teaching this class, <laughs> um, I would say, yay, the majority of you um, answered correctly. And um, although I may not have done a very good job of explaining the different types of assessment, most of you understood that I explained the three types of assessment and then asked you, did you get that? And most of you said, yes, this is, this is a meta kind of question, right? This is a formative assessment. So. Very good. Yeah, the pre-assessment, for those of you that thought it was a pre-assessment, uh, we sent out a pre-assessment before the class, uh, and that's the difference between the two. And it can be hard if you're not used to seeing these things, yeah. um, but during the pre-assessment, we asked you questions about how much do you know about assessment? And we actually had a pretty much a bell curve with those responses. So most people were right in the middle. Uh, and then when we asked, how comfortable are you interacting online? Uh, most people were very comfortable with that, or mostly comfortable. So that set us up to know that trying interactive activities was a good idea. Right. We should be back to just the screen share. Um, yes. Okay. And now I'm going to talk a little bit about um, designing uh, learning outcomes. And one of the sources that I really like for um, Logan, this wasn't in the plan, but just if anyone has any question about that, like the people who just maybe pop it in the chat and yep. we can address that later. But I'm sorry, go ahead. No, definitely pop it in the chat or raise your hand and Claire yeah, will right. help point out and stop us so we don't go too far. So now that we've covered types of assessment, uh, we're going to talk about situating your assessment in context is really what this section does. Uh, and I have a graphic on the screen for um, backwards design for learning. And this is from Wiggins and McTie. Uh, it's from 2005, but it's an oldie but a goodie. It's a very popular uh, format that's used. And it's used a lot in K-12, but it has driven most of my um, learning design and my lesson plan writing um, since I've been a librarian. So we start with stage one, which is to identify the desired results. And that's the what do they need to do piece. Uh, and once we know what the outcomes are, uh, the what they need to do, we can figure out how can we come up with the acceptable evidence. And I actually saw a webinar with um, McTie, I believe, and he talked about, uh, actually it was Jay Wiggins, sorry, uh, and he talked about the evidence is sort of like a courtroom. You need to think about putting the student on trial as being responsible for their learning. And they're innocent until proven guilty. So how can we decide what evidence would convict the student beyond a reasonable doubt with the, the crime of knowing that information? 
And that's always been helpful for me because it doesn't mean that just telling students things is going to be the, is going to necessarily meet my outcome. I'm going to need to be sure to get some sort of feedback, some sort of an assessment, even if it is just a nodding of the head, um, to know that the students understand. Oh, yeah, and then, I'm, nodding, I'm nodding my head. Yep. <laughs> yep. And I see several people nodding, which is good. And I should say that that type of formative feedback is extremely valuable. Uh, and don't think that I have a written assessment for every single step along the way. That's not really how I do it. Um, I save a lot of my big assessments for the end of my class. Um, and it is formative still because we don't know that they've met that outcome or goal, like the acceptable evidence might be their paper or their project or their bibliography. And they don't have that done when they come into my library classroom. They don't have it done by the time they've left. So the only acceptable evidence I can come up with in that class might be, can students find two articles? Can students explain why they chose the keywords they chose? And maybe they're doing it writing, just writing that down. Maybe I'm using some like a classroom response system and I'm polling people. Uh, but it's going to be formative at that statement at that stage if you think about the acceptable evidence really being their paper. And so often I think librarians get confused there or we take it upon ourselves to feel so incredibly responsible for that final paper when we don't see that. We don't know. And so we can only collect so much evidence. And then stage three is the learning experiences. So now that I know what my acceptable evidence is going to be, I can figure out how to move my students to that place. Does that make sense? Feel free to use a reaction if you have them. Great. Do a quick gallery view check. Yay. Okay. All I can do is clap. <laughs> yeah, you're a co-host. Okay. So now we're on to specific student learning outcomes. So we're just for a moment, I'm going to review what um, an, a student learning outcome is um, because assessment doesn't make sense without them. Uh, evidence about what? So the student le learning outcome is the what. What do you want students to be able to do or to know um, as a result of the, of the lesson? Um, student learning outcomes in it needs to be really clear, concise, um, preferably brief. You want to measure one thing at a time, especially in formative assessment, right? Because you're they're little bite-sized pieces, so and they need to be measurable. Um, and so they often start with the phrase, "Students will be able to blank um, after you know whatever whatever that is, whatever your goal is." So concise, specific. Um, short and most importantly, measure measurable. Um, so, and we're going to be talking more because um, we collected some examples of student learning learning outcomes from you uh, with the pre in the pre survey. Uh, and Logan's now going to talk a little bit more about how to construct good student learning outcomes, and then we will move on. Okay. So one of the key tools I use is Bloom's Taxonomy. Um, this is something that anyone who's been through any sort of an education program knows. I actually remember from my education program having this multicolored she sheet thing that was stapled together uh, that each page was significantly longer so you could see all the verbs. It was originally conceived in 1956 and then updated in 2001. 
And when they updated it, they actually flipped the top two uh, categories. And so I'll be sharing with you the current version. There was also a digital version created in 2008. There are six tiers and it really is just a tool. It's supposed to help you think about higher order thinking skills. And so here's a nice chart I found. The only thing I don't like about this OER is that the verbs should end in ing uh, for most of what I've seen. So I've seen like remembering, understanding, applying, because learning is active. And so we start with the base layer, which is just to remember. And so in my session, maybe I want students to remember to start at the library homepage or remember that a librarian can help them. I don't expect them to understand that yet. I just want them to have that in the back of their minds. The next stage up is understanding where they can actually start to describe or explain. Um, so that would be, I can ask a librarian for help because he or she knows how to navigate the databases really well. Then we go to apply. And this is where they have to actually use what they've learned. So you're at the applying stage if you're having students develop keywords and then use them in a database. And that's when they can demonstrate that their keywords actually brought up results or didn't, right? Because we've had several times where students don't choose the best keywords or they just don't know yet. So they're still applying their information and it's not a, well, they applied it and they got it wrong, they're done. No, that's part of it. Analyzes that next step where they're actually going to maybe compare how the results look with how they thought they would look. And then they're able to say, you know, this doesn't look right. The next step up is evaluating where they actually try to argue why it didn't work or explain why it didn't work. I don't like using explain again because that's down below. Uh, so they may be able to critique why it didn't work. And then at the very top we have create uh, and that's where they will actually assemble uh, lists of references that they found from keywords that did work or they'll create a bank of keywords that actually did work. Uh, and so that's Bloom's. This is a K-12 representation of Bloom's that I found and it is really busy, right? And I, I see someone like getting close to their screen to try to see it. You will have access to this um, during the breakout sessions. Um, so don't fear. I really like this wheel because it does talk about the domains in the middle, but what I don't like is that it uses different verbs. So remember is the base level. And in this circle, it's knowledge. And I'm actually at home like touching my screen like you all can see me in the front of a classroom. Uh, understanding is comprehension, applying, analyzing, um, and then evaluating and creating. So they're not in the same order. Um, which is why I'm showing you this second. And the verbs are in the gold part. And what I really like about this and the reason I did decide to include it are the student products that you may have students come up with. So when they are analyzing, a model might be something that you want them to develop. Um, so if we think about our search strategy, Maybe they're going to develop a model of how you could truncate different keywords. Okay. Um, but if we want them to just be at that base knowledge level, maybe we want them to just write down the name of the database that they need to use if you're in a subject specific course. Or maybe they just need to write down um, the reference desk email. So you want them to have the knowledge of it. Okay, so now I'm going to turn it over to Nancy, who's going to talk about some of the SLOs you submitted. 
And you're muted, Nancy. You are now unmuted. Nope. There we go. <laughs> Got it. Sorry. Um, Logan, I, I thought we'd have more of a discussion about this. So I just okay. went, um, I went through the SLOs that everyone submitted. Thank you so much. And um, I just picked out a few that I just thought were like good examples of a nice solid SLO. Um, and obviously, you know, there's a limit, limited time, limited space. Um, so I just wanted to talk about a couple and why, why I like them. So just look at the, or why I think they're good examples of SLOs. Um, students will be able to identify a scholarly article, okay, so that's what they should be able to do in, in their search results based on a number of features. So they're going to identify, you know, you're going to have to like, you know, specifically, how are they going to identify, you know, um, write that down or however you have them do, do that task. Um, but I like the part based on a number of features. So right there in the learning outcome, I see the teaching aspect of it too. So you need to be taught the features um, or uh, this is similar um, to num the third one on that list, students will analyze information sources for cred credibility and rel reliability using evaluation tools. So you're going to teach, show them or teach them some evaluation tool, whether it's, um, you know, someone mentioned the SIF test, I've been using the Y method, um, different methods for, you know, determining rel credibility, credibility and reliability, and then they're going to you're going to see how they um, analyze. Well, analyze is kind of a high level. We might, but um, you know, you might want to play around with that that verb. I personally teach a lot of first year students, so what I I would be on the remember level, just like name name, you know, some um, ways how you would identify whether this source is credible or reliable. You know, depending on what level of class you're teaching, that determines, like Logan explained, the, um, the verb that you're going to use. Um, students will be, the second one, students will be able to use search techniques such as Boolean operators or truncation to modify a search statement. So there were a lot of uh, example SLOs that people submitted about search technique. I mean, that's, that's what we teach, right? How to search, how to construct an effective search. You, if you can be more specific, what that means, uh, what does an effective um, search means, and you want to show them one thing and see if they can apply that, then, you know, that's, that's the way to go. Um, students, at the end of the session, students will be able to, well, at the end of the session isn't exactly formative, but we weren't asking you specifically for formative SLOs, but at the end of the session, students will be able to identify at least two access tools, and I'm assuming, you know, maybe you are including Google as well as library databases um, in, your, in your teaching, appropriate for research on their topic. Again, very specific. Um, yeah, I really liked that one as a great SLO for an incoming class yes. or for a one shot. Yes. Um, yes. Because as I said earlier, we don't know how they're going to use it yet. We can, we can lead them to the tools, but we can't make them use them, right? Yeah. Um, so I really, I really appreciated seeing something like this because that's an SLO that I think I've had on a session. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. And um, students will be able to identify the components of an APA reference using uh, a journal article or a detailed record from CINAHL. So that suggests to me a class that is pretty much, you know, pretty kind of dedicated to that, that topic. Um, so whoever submitted that obviously knows, knows better than I'm just guessing. Um, but I think the, the wording for these works nicely and they're succinct and concise and that's great. Did you want to add anything else, Logan? Yeah, so I, I saw a question come up in the chat, and I think oh, it's a great question. So it's from Barbara, and it's, are we thinking of these SLOs as something just for the librarian or SLOs we should share with students? Oh, that is a great question. We sh yeah, we should always share. But I believe we should always share. I believe we should, too. And this isn't in the presentation, but there's actually something out there called Learning Targets, which is very close to an SLO, and this is yeah. very K-12. Um, I work with education classes, and so I will see, especially when we have the adjuncts come in that teach K-12, they will start off with learning targets. And learning targets are basically SLOs, but written in an, as an I can statement. So 
for that, for, for that first one, I will be able to identify a scholarly article in search results based on a number of features. Uh, and it sort of helps to shift the, the onus onto the student because that's something that they'll be able to do. So it does empower them. Yeah. Um, and then Jocelyn shares that she uses SLOs in as, as an agenda slide for students at the beginning of classes and Lisa does as well. Yes. Um, I am bad at doing that. I do verbally say what we're going to accomplish, um, but writing it down is always great. No. Do we do that for you all here? I'm just, I don't know, he's like, did we do, was that clear? I don't think we, I don't think we practiced what we preached. We didn't specifically say what you'll be able to do by the end. Or of your, yeah, by the end of the session. Yeah, so by the end of the session, you will be able to um, share out one assessment that you've developed in the course of the, the session. Yeah. We talked about it. Between we definitely ourselves. talked about it. We have a whole lesson plan. Uh, but it is not fit for participant consumption in the way it is. It's very uh, notes outlined uh, and good ideas. And that's also important too. You don't have to have perfect, pristine lesson plans for every session you're going to teach. Uh, sometimes I walk in and I just have a couple bullet points. And like my SLO might be show them education source so that they know where to start. Uh, and Barbara just shared that uh, where she is, they usually share modified SLOs um, so the language has less jargon. That's great. Yeah. Um, and that's one of the features of the I can statements. Um, they're generally worded in ways that students understand what they can do as a result of the session. Um, Logan and Sarah, we did have a question come up. Um, earlier, uh, someone wanting to know, will there be, um, will everyone will be receiving some kind of follow up afterwards, um, like access to the slides and all of that. I believe that's the case, but yes. I wanted to check with you guys. Yes, um, the slide deck will go into that Google folder. Um, so you'll have access to it. Um, I have thought about putting it in before the presentation, but I didn't want to risk someone inadvertently editing the slide deck um, in real time or deleting the slide deck. So it will be put in, um, I'll put it in there right as we start the breakout groups. So you have access to it. Excellent, thank you. Okay. Great. Very good. So I now have, I have a slide here called the assessment toolbox. And these are some things I found online in addition to some of the favorite sources that you shared. Uh, and did, are you seeing a PDF right now? Good. I always like to double check. I taught one horrible online course where every time I had to share something or change a link, I had to stop sharing my screen and resharing it. So I always check now. So this is a PDF I found that I've used before. It's uh, 53 ways to check for understanding. And there's just a whole lot of different ways that you can think about doing assessment. It's double lined or double sided. And some of these would not necessarily work in a classroom. Like in a library session, you are not going to have students create a podcast um, in one 50 minute session. Now, if it were a session uh, for audio engineers and you were showing them resources to incorporate with a tool, you might have them create a quick podcast, maybe like a commercial. Um, the color cards I really liked. Uh, that is very simple. Uh, you can actually use paint swatches for this as well. You go into any hardware store like Home Depot and just take from the paint wall um, and you can hand them out to students. Um, I've also used paint swatches to divide students up into groups based on color where they just take and pass and you get to group people that way. Um, I actually did that in a job interview with faculty members. It was quite fascinating how excited they were to join groups. Uh, but there's a whole lot here. And you'll be able to browse this as part of the activity we're going to have you do. The next one is 56 different ways. And this is just a slide deck. It's much less glamorous. Um, but it does walk through different types of assessments. And then I also found this nice guide on formative assessment. It's from K-12, but I think that we in the library world 
can really benefit from the formative techniques that are used in K-12. Um, and especially what's used in literacy seems to be very applicable. And so this, this is a bigger primer on what is formative assessment if you want that for later. Um, but then on page 20, uh, we can go to, uh, we can go to page 15 has the starts and it's different types of formative assessments you can use. So there are some tools. When you, we surveyed you all, um, people mentioned using reflective prompts. And I think reflections are really important. And that whole metacognitive piece and taking a minute or two to think about what you know so far actually helps you move it around in your brain and start that process of committing it to like a long-term memory from short-term memory. Several people mentioned tools, so I wanted to just list them here. LibWizard was a big mention. Kahoot, Mentimeters, Plickers, which I was surprised someone knew about Plickers because I, I love the concept of Plickers. Can I see a thumbs up from people who know what Plickers are? So we have about four people. Um, does someone in the workshop want to explain what Plickers are? So you don't have to listen to my voice all the time. If you just put a hand up, if you'd like to explain, we can make sure that you're unmuted, but you should have the ability to unmute yourself. Okay. We know one person. Nope, maybe, maybe not. Do I need to invoke the wait time rule where I just wait until it gets so uncomfortable someone feels the need to speak? Hi, Logan. My name's Brendan. I, I can explain. It what always are. works. The wait <laughs> time always works. Thank you, Brendan. Sure. So clickers are this instructional technology where you can they're little devices that are typically handed around in like a lecture hall where uh, the lecturer can uh, gather audience responses really quickly. Yes, and so thank you. That's exactly what they are. So they are physical objects that you print out and hand out to your students um, and they look like QR codes. But what's interesting about them is depending on the orientation of the device, it gives a different response. And then you use your camera or a cell phone and you sweep around the classroom and through the magic of technology, it tells you how people answered the question. Okay. Um, it is free for a classroom set, I believe. I don't remember how many total you get, but it, it's, it, it's a really fun tool to break out and it's, extremely low tech for the participants. Okay, so we've made really good time. And it is now time for breakout rooms. So what you're going to do after I sort you into breakout rooms, you're going to work together with your new close friends and you're going to think about a class that you've taught in the past that maybe needs a new or a different assessment. You may already have the SLO and using the tools we provided and your librarian skills, because you have those, you bring them everywhere you go, uh, you're going to brainstorm a formative assessment that might work. And you're going to do this in a group. You will write up the assessment and a brief description of a learning activity. So we're gonna have like a severely truncated lesson plan. And then you're gonna share it as a Google Doc back in the folder. So what I wanna do there is sort of sh walk you through what you're going to do. So this is the folder that everyone has or should have access to. You're going to open the template document. Please do not edit this. It is the template for everyone. 
I have done my best to try to make it so that you cannot edit it, um, but please make a copy. So you're going to go to file. You will likely not have all of the options, but you will have make a copy. And then you're going to give it a name for now um, in your group. Only one person in your group needs to do this part. Uh, and then they're going to share it in the same folder. You may have to go to your shared with me to find the pre-conference folder um, if you didn't add it to your Google Drive. So you're going to share it and work in your Zoom room with people. You should have full capabilities to share screens, to talk through. You could have one person type if you want. You could all work on the Google Doc. You could use the share link in the chat um, to share that Google Doc so you can all work on it together. And you're going to fill out the template. You can delete the directions at the top once you've renamed your document. And I'm just going to do a quick copy of that document in case something happens. Uh, give it a title. Give it a, a synopsis, your student learning outcomes. You might only have one outcome and that's fine. Uh, your assessment, and here are those links to those documents. Uh, and then talk a little bit about the learning experience. And because it's 2020 and we're all remote, we decided to add in a section for online. So think about how you might do this assessment if, it were, if your class were fully online over Zoom. Does that make sense? Can I get a thumbs up? Okay. Great. And thank you to the people that actually did like a thumbs up. I like seeing that. Uh, so I'm going to stop my share. And we have now reached the portion where I am going to send people to breakout rooms. Oh, you're good. Breakout rooms. And there are 61 participants. So we're gonna do we're gonna do 15 breakout rooms, which means about three to four people to a room. I'm gonna stop recording right now. Oh yeah, I'll pause. Okay. So I am now going to share the presentation again. And so Hopefully you had enough time to get something down. It doesn't have to be perfect. They're just ideas at this phase. Uh, and now it's time for breakout rooms part two. If we were all in a room at Utica, uh, and I don't know if we would have been able to fit 90 people into a room or 80 people in a room, we would have had you maybe work on chart paper and posted that around the room. And we would have from there then had you do what's called a gallery walk where you would just walk to each of the rooms and you would look and take ideas down, think about what worked. So I'm actually gonna send you into small groups again. Um, and what I want you to do is in your group, just browse the folder together, have someone share their screen uh, and maybe look at them together and think about how those assessments or those formative assessments that people came up with, you could adapt for your own use. Um, because the whole point of the pre-conference is for you to take away something about assessment. Um, that's what makes it a little different than an actual just a session. So I am now going to stop the share and stop the recording. Yes. Okay. Right. So now, thank you. Yeah, like Logan said, you've all done a lot of work. Now it's time to take a moment um, to self-reflect, uh, think a minute, um, and to prepare for your fall assessment, information literacy assessment plan, or even the rest of your summer. Take a minute to reflect on what you've learned today. Uh, and just what you plan on doing in the way of assessment in, in the future, this, the rest of the summer or this fall semester. Write down those ideas and save them for yourself as a reminder after your break. So just take a minute. This is the one minute paper. This is the, we're not going to be collecting these, Logan and I. This is just for you to have 
Yep. So you don't lose your ideas. And we'll give you a minute. A minute. Okay, I think that was about a minute. Uh, and so hopefully you now have an idea or two to move forward with for fall. Uh, the important part is going to be to put this one minute paper somewhere you will find it in August. Uh, if you're like me, I write down best laid plans and then find them in the middle of September. So that's our session for today. Uh, you will be emailed a post-assessment survey. Uh, it'll go out and it'll help us learn how we did on this. Um, and then, Nancy, do you want to talk about the interest with the OER? Sure. So part of our um, pre-survey was for you to uh, name, whether, name whether you had a, a favorite uh, library instruction and in assessment source. And I said to Logan, no, I don't. And he suggested, why don't you we work together with the SUNY librarians and come up with our own OER source uh, for information literacy assessment. So part of that post survey will ask you whether you'd like to work on that and I collaboratively. I'm looking forward to seeing those yeah. people who are interested. Thank you so much. Your participation was awesome. It's always so much fun to work with SUNY librarians. Yeah, it was great today. Thank you. Thank you.